Welcome everybody to XBO Soft and our webinar this week, which is titled Engineering Mindset for Corporate Management, with guest speaker Dr. Alan Harbiter. Before we get started, a little bit about our company. XBO Soft has been around for several years now, since 2006. We offer software quality consulting and testing across various domains such as healthcare, finance, energy and entertainment and we offer various services from the basic functional manual testing all the way through to mobile usability um, and performance testing across multiple devices. We're a global company with offices across the world so we offer pretty much a 24-7 service. Um, we're a pretty big company. Just to introduce you to the house rules, uh, just so you know that you're all in this in only mode, so only the speakers will um, be audible. Questions can be posted on our questions panel on the right-hand side. Um, you can even go through Twitter at XBOsoft, and we will try our very best to answer those questions for you. Um, and we'll also have a Q&A at the very end of the presentation. Uh, you'll also receive recording of the webinar on the YouTube channel. We'll email those out to you and also the slide deck on SlideShare. To introduce you to our speakers, we have Dr. Alan Harbiter, who has joined us as an advisory board member. Hello, Alan. Hi, Sabrina. Hi, how are you? Very good, thanks. Good. Uh, and we also have Jan Prinson, who also um, works as one of the directors at XBA Soft. Hi, Jan. Hi, Sabrina. Thank you very much Hi. for... for <laughs> and I'm now going to turn you over to Jan. <laughs> no problem. I'm going to turn you over to Jan. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much for the introduction, Sabrina. And Alan, welcome here. I'm looking very much forward to your presentation today. One of the questions I had, or I was wondering about, um, when you were in engineering school, did you ever see yourself ending up as an executive, a manager? <laughs> well, I graduated at the uh, uh, young age of 22, and I and I really did not see any of that coming. I certainly didn't see um, myself as managing um, a 1,700-person company. Um, but I think uh, this is something I share with a lot of people who start off in engineering technical backgrounds, educational backgrounds, and career backgrounds. Uh, at some point in time, you uh, are given an opportunity, or you make your own opportunity. Uh, to transition in some way away, away from technical topics, uh, you're either, either given that you're doing well at your uh, field, you're given a couple of people to work for you and help uh, work on a larger task or leverage your own time and capabilities. And it kind of starts you down that path. It seems pretty benign at first, but after a while you get to the point where you say, is, you know, this is not something that uh, I've trained for, this is not something that um, I have any formal background in, can I live up to the challenge? And so that's the audience I'm, I'm targeting today to, to some degree. It's uh, uh, the audience that has started out in a uh, scientific field, either trans in the transition to or fully transitioned to management responsibilities. And uh, I'm hopefully going to give that uh, audience uh, those audience members a little bit more confidence that uh, they do have the skills to take on the challenge. Uh, and, and certainly uh, there have been many people uh, who've walked in their, in their set before them. Uh, and I'm going to do that by, uh, as, as a proof by example. I know that those in technology don't like proof by examples, but uh, nonetheless, here it is. I'm using my own uh, career arc to illustrate how that transition is made, or was made for, from my standpoint. Uh, and I'm going to run you through a few examples of uh, how the engineering uh, view of the world uh, works to address business problems. So uh, I'll jump right in. Now. Please interrupt me uh, whenever with questions, or if you have a question from the audience, I'm happy to, to uh, divert uh, uh, to answer them. I will. So uh, I'll start off by saying yes. Sorry, I will. I will. If there are any questions, I will. I will let you know. Oh, very good. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start off by saying that, uh, in my completely unbiased uh, opinion, 
uh, engineering, I believe, is a better starting point for corporate management than formal business training. And, and no, uh, no aspirations to those who went that way, who started out with a business degree or started out with some uh, related management style degree. But I think that the, uh, the analysis, this analytical discipline and the background of engineering uh, really is ideal for, for addressing some of the questions that you, uh, you run into as, uh, in corporate management. So as I said, I'll illustrate that uh, using the example of the company I co-founded way back in 1985, uh, starting out as a kind of a managing engineer uh, and ending up as chief operating officer. And I'll also give a couple of um, uh, examples of how an engineer views some, some typical business problems, although uh, there's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek I have to warn you beforehand uh, in some of these examples. But I think it does illustrate um, how an engineer kind of views the, the, uh, the problems presented in the business world. You know, I think, after all, uh, engineering in particular and other scientific disciplines they are all about uh, taking complicated physical systems uh, that exist in the real world uh, and uh, analyzing them, modeling them, and making predictions about them, for one, and for two, trying to influence the results that these systems produce by changing inputs to get a desired outcome. And that, kind of in a nutshell, is, is the goal of good corporate management. Uh, a business is usually a very complicated system, lots of moving parts, like external parts and internal parts. Uh, and the good manager has developed an understanding of, of how that system works and reacts, uh, is able to analyze uh, decisions based on uh, how that system works, and, and uh, make decisions that most of the time are in the best interest of the, of the business and of, uh, of the individual as a manager. So, um, what kind of blocks the uh, you know the uh, business from full understanding by uh, somebody with a technical background is, is largely terminology. Now, I'm not simplifying a little bit, but there's a lot of serious terminology in, in uh, the business world, uh, as there is in the, in the technical world. A lot of acronyms, again, as there is in the technical world. I, I threw one up here on the chart, the EBITDA, earnings before interest, uh, tax depreciation, amortization, that he's thrown around as the, one of the more mysterious of the of terms. But really, uh, and I'll say this in, a, in another part of the presentation and discussion, that anybody who's used to researching a, a technology area will have an easy time figuring out what these terms mean, how they're interrelated, and how to use them as part of an understanding of the, of the system that's in front of you. So I have um, two examples. One is the analysis of uh, balance sheets and income statements. Uh, and uh, I'll go quickly through that so, uh, so I don't um, uh, create a boring presentation. Uh, the uh, second is forecasts. And uh, anybody coming from a technology background knows that forecasting is uh, kind of a big part of the analytical work. Uh, I started out in uh, performance analysis, and um, uh, a lot, a lot of that work is forecasting uh, utilizations and, and response times, and uh, uh, other performance characteristics of a complicated system. So I'll take a look at uh, revenue and earnings forecast, and I'll also point out that I'm potentially leaving out personnel management. Um, it's just I can't talk about everything. I know personnel management is a big part of. Uh, some of what's daunting about the transition between uh, technical and, and management careers. All of a sudden, you have two, three, four, five, twenty, seventeen hundred people working for you, and uh, there's a lot of kind of intuition and uh, of skills that you uh, weren't taught <laughs> uh, in the technical background. And but I'm I'm just you know kind of limiting myself a little bit. So I'm going to focus on the more analytical elements. So let me give you a quick uh, timeline here uh, to summarize my career, my 30-year career in, in uh, a couple of minutes. I started out with an electrical engineering degree in 19, way back in 1978. Uh, I met my partners in my first job. Those are the two guys in the picture in the lower right-hand corner. Um, I worked for a large company, uh, Computer Sciences Corporation, 
I was interested in uh, computer systems uh, coming out of Cornell. Uh, in 1978, they didn't have a, uh, a pure computing degree, so I ended up with an electrical engineering degree. Uh, and uh, kind of clicked with these two gentlemen who I met at CSC, and in 1985, we co-founded a company with uh, called Performance Engineering Corporation that was focusing on the uh, performance analysis of computer systems. Three guys, $50,000, not a lot of a lot of money to get started with. Uh, and in the uh, uh, late 90s, I transitioned from my uh, job managing all the technical people in the company to uh, being chief technology officer, which I like a lot. The nice thing about uh, starting your own company is you could kind of pick your title and pick the job you wanted to do. Uh, so I picked the CTO, which wasn't entirely a management role. Uh, in early 2000, we took advantage of the big internet wave. Uh, there was a lot of companies going public, and uh, it was it was kind of a gold rush. So in April of 2000, uh, this is 2001. But in April of 2000, we took uh, PDC public. Uh, I also, while that was happening, I was working on my PhD. I, I decided that I did I was not interested in the MBA, although I took some business courses. I, I actually took the GMAT, applied to a few schools, but. Uh, really uh, still love computer science, so I went back for a PhD instead of a, uh, an MBA. By 2004, running the company had become uh, difficult enough that we needed more hands on deck in pure management roles. And I transitioned from uh, chief technology officer to chief, chief operating officer, and essentially had 1,700 people by 2005 working for me. Uh, at that point in time, we uh, went from uh, uh, Fifty million dollars a year, which was our revenue when we were uh, went public with 250. So we were able to successfully use our our public public trading status to grow the company substantially. And uh, the last day here is 2005, because we sold the company in 2005 for 472 million dollars. So from our initial 50 thousand dollar investment, uh, we had pretty good uh, run over the 20 years. So here's just a little more, more detail. In, in 1985, it seems like a long time ago, but uh, it was a very pivotal time in, for the U.S. economy. Uh, uh, Jimmy Carter had just left office. Interest rates were in the high teens. Uh, Ronald Reagan took over, and interest rates went down to uh, the, the high single digits, which still seems high by current measures. But at that point in time, it just seemed like there was a lot of free money around. So that was maybe the first round of gold rushes for new company formation um, prior to the internet. And uh, we started then, and a lot of other companies started as well. Uh, we just kept our head down for, for um, a few years. Uh, and by 1999, we finally found ourselves with a reasonable sized company, $50 million in annual revenue, uh, solid growth every year, solid um, uh, profit profitability north of 10% net, which was great for our segment of the business uh, community. And um, I credit a lot of that to um, the engineering backgrounds of all three founders of the company. We knew how to analyze costs. We knew how to control. We learned how to control costs, and we kept the company very, uh, very profitable. Talk about that a little bit more about that later as well. Uh, again, in 2000, public at PC Solutions, we sold 3 million shares at $9.50. A year later, we had a follow-on offering, and between those two, we raised $85 million uh, for growth. So we had a little war chest. And in 2001 to 2004, we went on a buying spree, which kind of tees up the next part of my discussion. In order to buy companies, uh, you first look at their uh, resume. And the resume is essentially uh, two, two tables, uh, income statement, balance sheet. And so I got pretty adept at looking at um, you know, groups of companies uh, in first, uh, first by examining two tables, the income uh, statement and, and the balance sheet. And we would literally get a batch of 20 or so of these you know, corporate resumes and flip through them and say, okay, here are the five that are worth pursuing based on that first cut. So, uh, you know, having never seen an income statement or balance sheet, this became part of the, uh, the start of the process. Uh, we bought 
four uh, companies you see here. Uh, we start off small, less than $3 million. Uh, we try to focus on companies that would add to our, uh, our reach. Uh, we ended up buying a company that was about $50 million in annual sales. Uh, so we learned how to do it. Um, and uh, over the years, uh, all those uh, acquisitions were fairly successful. So uh, what, how would an engineer look at evaluating an acquisition target to buy and whether to buy a company or not? And, you know, I'm saying engineer here, but this is, is more, uh, I think, general. This is the uh, good analytical thinker, how, how that person would, would look at this problem. Uh, there's qualitative stuff. And in every, even engineering or technical problem, there's always, quali always qualitative issues that you can't uh, uh, put a number on. So you have to learn ways to uh, balance and juggle qualitative issues. And uh, you know, that's kind of a standard. This standard is part of the engineering, engineering approaches. Uh, examples are alignment of goals and culture, kind of a soft, fuzzy um, a factor, but one that's got to be uh, weighed into the decision to purchase. Um, can the value that this acquisition offers be grown in-house? Uh, you know, you certainly, rather than spending a lot of money to buy a company, if you said, uh, a capability you can develop in-house in your own company, you, you know, you look up further. And uh, furthermore, are the two cultures of the two companies, the buyer and the the seller, are they mergeable? Will the, will the successes of the company you're buying still remain successes after the purchase takes place? So there's also the quantitative stuff. Well, I'm going to focus on that a little bit. The big question that all the uh, outside um, market analysts ask is, will the purchase be accretive? You know, and then there's, there's the, one of your second uh, uh, mystery business terms. And what accretive means is that, will the finances of the combined company be better than the finances of, of the individual companies? So will the company you're buying contribute to uh, your, uh, the, the market view of your success? Uh, so we're going to look at income statement and balance sheets for target acquisition. Let's say we wanted to buy uh, Facebook, which is a company I think everybody knows, or maybe most people know of anyway. Uh, their uh, income statements on Yahoo. Uh, and Yahoo is one of my favorite sites for looking at uh, financial information of these trading companies. Uh, and this is, looks very similar to the statements we would, income statements we would get for companies we were acquiring. Uh, numbers are a little bit larger here. So let's pick out a few numbers right off the bat. The most important one, of course, is always the bottom line, bottom net profitability. Very good looking for Yahoo, for uh, Facebook, excuse me. 19% um, currently of revenue. In, in calendar year 13, the last year before the year on, on Yahoo. Uh, and that's been uh, up, up 1% from last year and up 18% from the year before. So uh, how's the top line revenue? 37% uh, revenue growth year to year, 11 over 12 over 11, 65% in the uh, calendar 13. So not only is uh, revenue growing every year, the growth is accelerating. Excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pitching uh, Facebook here. Uh, so what are weird things, anomalies about this uh, uh, income statement? Well, we see there's a huge uptick in uh, general administrative and research costs in uh, 2012. But there's an explanation for that, and the explanation is that's the year they were public. Uh, but looking at this income statement, I would ask that question, what happens? But they're doing the right thing. They're spending more money on R and D as they should. That's a good use of proceeds from their IPO. Also, notice know it's very low interest expense. Probably not much debt. If you buy the company, you've got to take over all their debt. Uh, so you want to see how much uh, debt responsibility you're taking on. So, how did we use this kind of information? I think this is exactly the things we looked for in companies we were buying. If we saw that there was the big that expense, we want to find out why. Did they have a project that went south? They, they try a product development uh, that, that didn't go well. How long is it going to take to, take to recover from that? Is that a sign that the company uh, makes, the company uh, management makes bad decisions? So there's a lot you can tell from this income statement that is kind of below the covers. Uh, and the analysis he uses is kind of simple, very simple, straightforward engineering analysis. I'll get into a little bit more complicated analysis in my last example, but uh, you know, this is very basic stuff. I wanted to convince you that the numerical analysis is not complicated in most cases. So here's the balance sheet. 
uh, we see that um, they've got a lot of cash on hand, uh, $3 billion, okay, with uh, $1.8 billion in annual costs. They could fund operations uh, even if they get a cash strapped. So very good sign of financial stability. There's that low debt that they have, four hundred twenty million million, not very much debt at all. Uh, so now we have to decide on how much we're going to pay for um, Facebook. Uh, so we look at some key statistics. Uh, market capitalization, which is the uh, price per share times the number of outstanding shares. Uh, you're going to have to buy everybody's shares to buy the company. Uh, that's $200 billion, and that's on the top line of this table. And right there, we see this might be a showstopper. Uh, while their performance is excellent and their price does not seem, I'm looking at their price to earnings ratios as well, they don't seem outrageously priced, they're still probably richer than any acquirer would consider. The largest prior, how this is in the note, the largest prior acquisition was the AOL Time Warner World merger at $186 billion. So coming up with a greater than $200 billion, you're probably going to have to pay a premium to consider this other stock. It's probably too heavy a list. So, you know, this is uh, kind of a, a non-realistic uh, uh, example, but it's exactly the kind of thought process we go through Alan, in the five minutes I've been talking about it. Could yeah. you give us a real example, how you use uh, financial statements of a company to influence your decision making, say in acquiring it or not acquiring it? Sure, sure. Yeah, as I said, this was the first task. So we get information on, on 20 or so companies that were being offered to us by mostly by investment bankers. We'd look at their uh, income statements and balance sheets. And we'd look for these things that reveal the hidden story. Uh, for instance, one of the companies we looked at um, seemed to be pretty good. Uh, you know, you look at things like um, uh, different uh, uh, cuts at the profitability. Maybe the company's not so profitable now. Can it be rehabilitated? And we saw a company that had a lot of debt, uh, debt payment that was cutting into profitability. And we thought, well, if we could just pay off that debt, can we make them profitable? Uh, so we dug a little further when we saw that high debt. And we found out that it was from some operations that weren't, uh, you know, so uh, uh, forthright. Uh, the owner had lent the company money. The company was paying back the owner at a high rate. It was a bit of a conflict. So, um, you know, you use that to reveal uh, kind of the hidden story, and we passed on that immediately, that passed on that company immediately. So, um, uh, like I say, the, uh, these two tables give you a feel for uh, what to look for uh, to find the real story of how, how the company's operating. It's just something that you want to add to your, uh, to your uh, future. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thanks. So I'm going to transition to a little bit more complicated analytical analysis and talk about revenue income forecasting, which is incredibly important, particularly for publicly traded companies. I use an example back from a 2010 a company called MicroStrategy. I think they're still around. They're a, a business intelligence company. Uh, they're fairly successful. Uh, and every quarter, the, the senior management of the company has to project, predict for the next quarter uh, earnings and uh, sales. And incredible, uh, Wall Street expects incredible accuracy in these predictions. Uh, the example I'm using, and this is a, you know, a, a snippet from a press article, um, market strategy was 3% uh, off of their previous prediction for um, um, earnings and 1.3% uh, off in uh, sales. Uh, on, however, both of them were up uh, year over year. Uh, that day, the stock price got, dropped uh, 18%. So um, what, what's, what Wall Street is looking for is an under, that you understand your business, that you know how it will grow, and uh, they want you to predict, obviously, that it will grow, but if it doesn't, uh, they'd rather have you know why and uh, condition them for it, and you'll, you'll probably be punished less in terms of stock price if you can explain you know, why you're going to take a, a loss and, and uh, can forecast that. So you know, I took a look at this situation. I said, okay, you know, I've predicted 
perform some complicated systems before. That's what I've done as an engineer. How do you do it? Well, you know, you 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 do um, things like curve fitting. Uh, you make complicated models, and uh, maybe they're stochastic models. Uh, but if you consider all the right factors and enough factors, you should be able to be pretty good at prediction. You know, why do you even need a CFO? You could you could do that yourself. So. <laughs> Here is my somewhat tongue-in-cheek analysis. It's a complicated graph, but I'll, I'll step you through it. I, I think it's not that complex if you kind of look at the components. So the main thing I'm graphing from the real world here is quarterly revenue. Those are the blue dots. And you can see we're generally on a good trajectory over time. Our, our quarterly re re revenue is going up. Okay, we had some dips and things like that. The black line was just a multivariate curve fit. So if I were an engineer and I didn't want to, uh, you know, I want to treat this like any complicated system, I just do a multivariate curve fit, and that was the black line. And that how, um, sometimes I would come pretty close. Uh, most of the time I would come pretty close. The red uh, line is our stock price. It's all normalized, so it kind of fits on the same thing. And you can see our stock price is all over the place, unfortunately. Uh, and I also added these little blue horizontal lines here and there to show the forecast. And in some cases, the forecast was below uh, revenue. In some cases, it was above. We usually give a range, so that's why there's two blue lines. And in situations where uh, we were below, uh, we were above the forecast, uh, excuse me, where our revenue was below the forecast, our stock price took a big hit. So I'll just took point out some portions here. Um, there's this kind of second hump in the camel uh, back uh, right over here. And uh, here we kind of under forecasted. Uh, we exceeded our forecast a little bit. We had a nice uptick in price. Uh, then the next one we, um, we over forecasted. Uh, we were at a point where um, the stock was a little bit overpriced. We took a huge guy. Okay, that was a big problem. Um, here's another interesting uptick. Around here, uh, the analyst said that it was shortly after uh, the unfortunate events of uh, September uh, 2011, uh, terrorist attacks on the uh, United States. And the analyst said that we were the company to uh, benefit uh, from that unfortunate event, that uh, the, everybody would be investing in uh, the Homeland Security, we were going to be the company that was going to be benefiting from that. Our stock went way up, almost to uh, the mid 60s. Um, and of course, there's only one way to go from that, and that is way down. So, you know, this was a very frustrating time for me as a corporate manager. I was trying to take a crack at, uh, you know, predicting uh, revenue and doing it well, uh, and wasn't doing really uh, that great a job. Um, Maybe I should have stuck with you know my engineering intuition and just used the cycle curve and not even thought about it that much. So um, it did help though to you know kind of take a very analytical view of it, and I think as close as we were able to get was because of uh, the analytical approach we took. Uh, earnings we had to be forecasted as well, and I'm going to show those two charts on the, those two charts on the same. Uh, uh, opposite each other because they're remarkably similar. You could see, of course, stock prices the same number graph, but earnings kind of trace revenue, and the forecasts kind of end up in the same way. If we we uh, underpredicted revenue, we tended to underpredict earnings, and uh, same thing if we overpredicted revenue, we tend to overpredict earnings and took a hit on both. Okay, so I've given two examples. Uh, and I'm trying to uh, demonstrate how the business uh, system uh, can be uh, analyzed using the same approaches that engineers use to anal analyze other physical systems. What other questions can we answer? Well, I think it's all the kind of primary questions uh, that, a, that a corporate manager faces. Can we grow, grow this company? I mean, that's kind of the fun and one of the fundamental questions um, that uh, a corporate manager has before him. And how can we grow? Uh, and that that question has to be viewed analytically. Uh, what areas are productive? What areas have not been uh, uh, exploited? And uh, what mechanisms are we using to bring a new business? Have, have they been successful? 
uh, it's an analytical approach that will you know, result in good growth. And that's what we found when we were running our business. Uh, how do you control costs and make sure profitability is good? You have to understand costs. You have to model costs. And uh, it takes a good um, model to be able to forecast what changes, uh, management changes will result in controlling costs. When to in invest in infrastructure? Infrastructure is important because you can't uh, run a company on a shoestring. Uh, and on the other hand, infrastructure costs a lot of money. So that's also got to be based on solid analytical analysis. How efficient are our business development processes? That you know, road goes directly to how to grow the company. Uh, and a measurement and numerical analysis are an important part of really assessing that. Are clients satisfied? It's kind of a qualitative question, but it can be answered quantitatively through uh, surveys and uh, addressed uh, by uh, um, staff training. And lastly, uh, you know, goal setting is important for the company. Annual goal setting, five-year goal setting. Uh, are the goals realistic? And the only way to assess that is through some uh, basic forecasting, as I, as I talk about with stock price and earnings. So let me give you the... Um, what happened with uh, the company I started in, eight, in 1985, uh, and uh, it'll kind of give you the final chapter. I think it's a story that ended well, but in an interesting way. Uh, as I mentioned, we sold in 2005. Uh, the shares were sold to a, a telephone company, Nortel Networks, a Canadian telephone company, at $15 a share. Uh, just to give you perspective on that, the initial uh, founder shares uh, cost five cents and the stock split 16 times. So um, it was a pretty good investment for, uh, for me. Uh, all cash deal uh, for, at 472 million. Uh, and what Nortel wanted was a, a US subsidiary that could do business uh, with the federal government and with state and local governments without having the overhang of uh, uh, being, uh, being uh, located in Canada. Uh, the three PC founders, myself and my two partners, had a two-year employment agreement. We left shortly thereafter, and shortly thereafter, Nortel unfortunately filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. It's a 200-year-old company uh, that uh, suffered from mismanagement, unfortunately. And um, I would like to uh, think that if the uh, senior managers at Nortel had a little bit of uh, a better engineering perspective on the company, that um, it would have done a little bit better. Uh, our portion of the company and a few other pieces of Nortel will sell to Avaya, another phone company, for $900 million. Uh, that piece of uh, Nortel had uh, $2.4 billion in revenue in 2008, uh, which was pretty good. <laughs> I thought it's a good buy for um, uh, Avaya. Avaya spun off the piece of uh, that business that was uh, my company in 2014 and sold it for 100 million. So again, um, you know, our original company that sold for 472 got sold at uh, a pretty good discount. And um, uh, I'm going to guess that perhaps uh, the uh, management decisions made during that period were not based on good engineering analysis. So I'll reflect a little bit uh, on my engineering training and think about what I got out of it and uh, where the gaps were. Um, certainly, I've been pushing this point that my engineering training taught me to uh, uh, broad, taught me some broadly uh, applicable analytical skills and a lot of the complicated systems that I analyzed as computer scientist, as an engineer, uh, helped me very much make decisions, management decisions. Uh, it got me past a lot of conceptual hurdles and, uh, you know, uh, uh, just address a lot of topics that you would, wouldn't, in a way you wouldn't normally address them uh, in, in an engineering program, in a scientific program, uh, and learn to think in a way that uh, is a little bit different than, um, you know, kind of your standard uh, uh, analysis methodology. Taught me how to research topics I, I started out knowing nothing about. And uh, that's how I, I kind of filled in the gaps in my um, business background. Taught me how to deal with people from a widely diverse backgrounds. I think if you, you know, anybody who's been through uh, any kind of science 
uh, educational background uh, has probably gone to school with people from all over the world, and that's beneficial. Uh, it's definitely beneficial in doing business in today's uh, today's, today's uh, environment. And it made me an expert in a selective technology field that gave me something to sell. It gave me uh, it gave me kind of a service to talk about with my clients that they appreciated. There were de definitely some gaps in my education that I had to fill in. I, I never really learned how to communicate well. Uh, hopefully, I'm over that now. <laughs> uh, kind of learned that from the School of Hard Knocks. But uh, I think uh, current education uh, engineering programs are, are starting to figure out that um, their graduates need to write and communicate, and uh, that's probably 50% of success in anybody's career. Um, my uh, science background training didn't teach me anything about business. I had to fill that in, but uh, I've been trying to claim in a completely unbiased way that that's something you can fill in if you treat it as something that you're, you want to learn about and research. Uh, didn't teach me anything about management in general, uh, and it didn't teach me some of the important ingredients of business success. Uh, I think those may be personality traits, which uh, you uh, you know you pick up over time or you don't. Uh, ambition, aggression, and this continual state of dissatisfaction with how things are. Um, so uh, I, I don't think I'm alone. I found this study. It's a little bit dated now, but um, I think some of the new studies kind of uh, present the same result. Uh, the majority of the uh, S&P 500 CEOs come from engineering undergrad degree uh, programs. Uh, you can see in 2008, 22%. It was a you know the largest uh, single back undergrad background of the S&P 500 CEOs. Now a lot of these CEOs, granted, got MBAs later, um, you know, on in their career. Uh, they probably uh, all took some business training to fill in gaps. But a lot of them came to their uh, started their career off with uh, in the same way I did with um, you know, good engineering uh, and analytical skills. Put a reference on the on the bottom of the screen. There's an interesting study that this came from that looks at a lot of characteristics of the S and P 500 uh, uh, CEOs. Uh, so uh, when you look at your own career arc and you say, "Is this make move make?" Sense for me, you know, do uh, how far do I want to go down the the management path? Uh, I think a lot of engineers and uh, scientists decide that uh, this is a way that uh, they can have more control over their future, that they could kind of guide uh, the application of technology better, uh, that they can do as good or better job as the people they see uh, in management. So what are some of the questions you have to ask yourself? I think you have to decide whether business as a subject matter interests you. Uh, I think it's very difficult to you know, force yourself into an area that just doesn't carry any interest. Uh, I think a lot of people who started out engineering started out there because they were fascinated by the, the science, by the technology, and just business doesn't seem to uh, uh, capture their interest as well. So I think it's got to be something you're interested in. I mean, that's kind of basic. I, I think it'll be one of your easiest research projects. I think it's a matter of understanding the terms, how they fit together, and you'll find out that the way uh, business systems work is not overly complex. Uh, it's um, you know a little bit more complicated than um, uh, I've been trying to present, but uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to bolster my argument. But it, it'll be one of your easiest research projects, certainly, if you have the interest. Uh, and uh, um, you, you have to, uh, I think, steer yourself towards analytical thought processes and away from fledgling intuition. I think there's areas where intuition kind of are required, but whenever possible, collect the data, do the analysis, make your decision based upon uh, the analysis. Uh, I think you always have to understand your weaknesses. This is probably advice that you know any. Uh, buddy would give about a career, regardless of the, uh, the background, uh, and surround yourself with people who who have commentating strengths. Uh, the senior partner in the three of us that started this, uh, our company uh, had an MBA from Wharton. That was a really good thing for me because I lacked some of the fundamental business understanding, and he was able to mentor me a lot in that in that area. And I've always looked uh, when faced with 
you know, multiple paths, look for options that give more options. So uh, it's always nice to have a uh, plan B in the works if you need it, uh, even as you're uh, selecting among plan A's. So, um, you know, that is almost a, a uh, uh, more of a security thing than anything else and, and a way to uh, expose more opportunities. So uh, those are my uh, prepared discussion today. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, and I, maybe I'll turn it back over to uh, Sabrina, who's going to talk about the ways to uh, ask questions, or, or we, Jan, whoever Yeah, we, wants we got a couple here. of questions, Alan. OK. We got a question from uh, Richard, and he was wondering if you experienced any drawbacks uh, with your engineering degree, or it's all positive. Um, I mentioned some of them. Uh, you know, when I was, uh, I got my uh, PhD in, um, in the early 2000s, so by then I think engineering program had changed quite a bit. But when I completed my degree uh, in 1978, it was still a very traditional uh, engineering program at Cornell. And uh, so a lot of the, um, you know, the soft skills that I think you need uh, uh, for the real world were not things I learned. And um, uh, I had a very kind of, unfortunately, um, a black and white view of the world. Uh, and you know, through my uh, engineering background, I always said, OK, well, this is the best answer. This is the engineering answer. And everybody else is wrong. Hmm. Uh, and you know, I think you learn through uh, years of, uh, of uh, the School of Hard Knocks that um, that's not always the uh, best way to uh, uh, approach uh, a problem, even if you, uh, you know, believe to the end that you know the right way, everybody else is the wrong way. So I, I think there is a little bit about the engineering mindset that uh, uh, does not work so well in the business world. But I think the advantages heavily outweigh the, the disadvantages. I think the analytical skills are priceless. And I think some of the prejudice you bring into a man management position based on a purely scientific and technical training um, uh, are just something that you, you know, you have to learn to live with and understand that it's, it kind of programs your personality from the four to ten years that you spent uh, um, uh, perfecting them. I don't know if you have any children or if they're in, in college age, but I wonder what did you recommend or what would you recommend to them study <laughs> So uh, anybody on the on the call who has children will know that whatever you recommend to them, we'll do the exact opposite. <laughs> so um, I was a little careful in, uh, in in making specific recommendations, but uh, I will say that none of them have chosen technology as as a field. Um, and you know, I think you've got to be the, really what I did try to recommend is that uh, if you um, love what you're doing, no matter what you're doing, you're doing, you'll figure out a way to make money at it. So uh, uh, I'll say that um, I think they're all, you know, uh, they're all kind of on their own now. The youngest is 25. They're all uh, successful doing their own thing, and none of them went to engineering. None of them had anything to do with uh, technology. And um, you know, my only criteria in the long run is are they happy? And they all very happy. So I'm, 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 uh, it makes me very satisfied. But um, yeah. You know, kids, kids, uh, you just got to set a good example. They'll, they'll do what they want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was, uh, these were the questions. Sabrina, I'll hand it to you to close out. Thanks a lot, Alan. Thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, uh, it's good spending time. Okay, are we, uh, Sabrina, are we done? Oh, I, I press the button, don't I? <laughs> I'll close it. Thank you everyone for attending yeah. and uh, we'll see you next time. You'll get an email with uh, information where you can find the slides and the recording and hope to see you next time. Thank you very much Sabrina, thank you very much Alan and speak soon everyone. Bye bye. Thank you everyone, bye bye.